Without further ado, I would like to now introduce Scandal on the Stage, Band Theater in Boston, directed by Jacqueline Romeo. Thank you very much. Immoral, indecent, impure, unfit were often used to describe the plays subjected to an all-out ban, or at least a visit from the censor's pen, but these were code words for branding any ideas that simply diverged from the worldview of Boston's ruling class. First, the Boston Brahmins, and later, as the old Yankees gave way to the new Irish, the Roman Catholic Church. The earliest Boston censorship in 1630, as reported by Governor William Bradford in his History of Plymouth Plantation, speaks of a certain free-thinking Mr. Morton who dared to create a secular community outside Bradford's jurisdiction. Morton became Lord of Misrule and maintained it as if it were a school of atheism. And after they got some goods into their hands and got much by trading with the Indians, they spent as vainly in quaffing and drinking both wine and strong waters in great excess. They also set up a maypole, drinking and dancing about it many days together, inviting the Indian women as their consorts, dancing and frisking together like many fairies, or fiories, rather, and doing worse practices. As if they had the new revived and celebrated the peace of the Roman goddess Flora, or the beastly practices of the mad Bacchanalians. Morton likewise, to show his poetry, composed sundry rhymes and verses some tending to lasciviousness and others to the detraction and scandal of some persons which he affixed to this idol or idol maple. What, no doubt, upset Bradford most of all was Morton's friendship with the Indians. He eventually was condemned for his free-thinking ways and sent back to Britain. Since the early settlers associated idleness and, by extension, leisure activities with immorality, it was not unusual by 1699 for a law to be enacted. To for the suppressing and punishing of rogues, vagabonds, common beggars, and other lewd, idle, and disorderly persons, and also for the setting the poor to work. Actors, along with jugglers, fortune tellers, common pipers, fiddlers, stubborn servants or children, common drunkards, common night walkers, hill burrs, and wanton and lascivious persons were to settle down and get to work or suffer the consequences. To be fettered, shackled, and moderately whipped, not exceeding ten strokes at once. Obviously, actors and others were less guilty here of blasphemy than of economic instability. The basis for modern censorship, however, came in 1712 with an... Act against intemperance, immorality and profaneness, and for reformation of manners. Here, finally, obscenity was seen as a separate offense, separate from blasphemy, but not completely divorced from religion. Whereas the laws at several times established by the government of this Her Majesty's province of Massachusetts Bay are now in force, have made good and wholesome provision for the regulation of inns, taverns, alehouses, vittlers, and other houses for common entertainment, and have also made good and wholesome provision against immoralities, vice, and profaneness, be it further enacted that no singing, fiddling, piping, or other music, dancing, or reveling 
shall be suffered or exercised in any tavern or other public licensed house, and whereas evil communication, wicked, profane, impure, filthy, and obscene songs, composures, writing, or prints do corrupt the mind, and our incentives for all manner of impieties and debaucheries. More especially when digested, composed and uttered in imitation or mockery of devotion or religious exercises, be it further enacted by the authority aforesaid that whosoever shall be convicted of composing, writing, printing, publishing of any filthy, obscene, or profane song, pamphlet, libel, or mock sermon in imitation or in mimicking of preaching shall be punished by fine to Her Majesty, not exceeding 20 pounds, or by standing on the pillory once or oftener with an inscription of his crime in capital letters affixed over his head. Total censorship occurred in 1750 with an act to prevent stage plays and other theatrical entertainments. This was a volatile time in American history, only a couple of decades before the revolution, and this ban had less to do with obscenity or religion and more to do with the British fear of public assemblies and the possibility of riots. After the colonists had declared their independence, more challenges to the law were evident. A 1791 petition read at, town, at a town meeting in Faneuil Hall asked for a repeal of the 1750 Act prohibiting theatrical entertainments. Repeal was considered and then voted down by the legislator. Theater proponents were not deterred, however, by 1792 they had found a way to supersede the law by creating new exhibition rooms in order to give moral lectures. One particular moral lecture called Sheridan's The School for Scandal was raided. I, John Hancock, objected to the law being so flagrantly ignored. Of course, I did not object to the play's content. It was just that the edict against theater had been violated. Oh. Despite Hancock's apparent diplomacy, his prejudice toward the theater was well known. Other opponents of the theater wrote letters to the editor. One satiric, anti-theatrical tract appeared in the Boston Argus, entitled Seven, Fav Seven Arguments in Favor of the Theater in Boston by Garrick's Ghost. Number two. Though we have several haunts for the profligate and abandoned, there is no general rendezvous. Theater enthusiasts, unfazed by Garrick's ghost, could read a 1793 advertisement that contained the double bill for Monsieur and Madame Placide and their tightrope, and Shakespeare's Catherine and Petruchio, or A Cure for a Scold. Several people, wanting a purpose-built theater in Boston, drafted a report to the legislation that condemned the 1750 law as... Unconstitutional! Because among the natural and unalienable rights of the people, recognized in the first article of the Declaration of Rights, is the seeking and obtaining of our own happiness. And theater contributed to that happiness. One might question whether they were motivated by their love of the theater or of money. Money makes the world go around, the world go around, the world. In 1794, the first purpose-built theater was born, aptly named the Boston Theater. And 12 years later, in 1806, the total ban on theater was lifted. An act for preventing public stage plays, interludes, and other theatrical entertainments in certain cases. You could have all the theater you wanted as long as you first obtained a license from the court of the general sessions of the peace. Of course, no good deed goes unpunished, and by 1825, theatrical practice in Boston was once again under scrutiny. This time, actors rather than plays were the subject of anti-theatrical sentiment. One of the most famous English actors of the 19th century, Edmund Keen, caused his Boston audience to riot, partly because America was seeking to divorce itself culturally from England, and partly because the audience disapproved of Keen's seeking a divorce from his wife while on his American tour. Boston's Mayor Quincy at the time refused to intervene in the riots, but the Board of Aldermen used the riots to justify assuming the powers to revoke any theater license as they saw fit. 
all theatrical exhibitions or public shows which hereafter may be licensed by the board shall be revoked or suspended notwithstanding the terms of such license whenever in the opinion of the mayor and the aldermen for the time being the same shall be necessary to preserve order and decorum and to prevent the interruption of peace and quiet. Thus, the foundation for theatrical censorship was finally laid. Cries of immorality continued when the construction of the Tremont Theater in 1827 was made public. Detractors pointed to the Keene riots as evidence of the depravity of actors. Five letters from a father were printed in the city newspapers to denounce the new construction. Later, these letters were jointly issued in a pamphlet entitled, Letters on the New Theater. With father's first letter, he hoped to discourage investment in the new theater altogether. Here shall assemble from evening to evening many of great worth and respectability. The company of the gay whose hearts are sad and of those whose only care is to be happy now. And here shall also come the painted heart, whose house is on the way to hell, and with her the veteran debauchee, whose path is strewn with broken vows and ruined innocence. The youth, too, the hope of his mother, with glowing passions, will come here to be devoured by vultures. From year to year, a multitude will enter here upon a course of dissipation in which they will be hurried to destruction. From age to age, many fond parents will weep tears of blood over their ruined sons and possibly their fallen daughters and wives and sisters will join the lamentation. By the fifth letter, the Tremont Theater had already been erected. The best father could do was make one last appeal to the sensibilities of the Boston public. In this theater are every night assembled a company of women from the hearts of infamy to pollute our youth and drag them away to the chambers of death. From the upper boxes and the pit issue exclamations fit only to be heard in hell! Such a detailed portrait makes one wonder if father drew it firsthand. Here, the theater, and interestingly, women in the theater, are explicitly seen as corrupting the morals of the youth. Sex with a capital S for sin being the offender. By 1835, a revised statute separated indecency from religion. Any writing, print, description, or figure that was manifestly tending to the corruptions of the morals of the youth was considered obscene. Prison sentences of up to five years or a, a dose of hemlock were permitted. By May of 1878, a public meeting in the vestry of the Park Street Church eventually evolved into the New England Society for the Suppression of Vice. Renamed New England Watch and Ward Society in 1891, this group initially sought to suppress gambling dens, prostitution, pornography, bribery, and graft in police circles. The society only gained notoriety after it moved into the realm of art and literature. Their first target was a French import called the Clemenceau case by Alexander Dumas, the son. The Clemenceau case involves Isa, a vampire wife, whose wicked ways scandalize her husband, Pierre. She eventually threatens to bring her husband's best friend to ruin. Ultimately, Pierre, fed up with her antics, murders her, then calls the police with an unruffled calm. The story of a disreputable woman who gets her comeuppance would appear to be the perfect moral tale for puritanical sensibilities, but somehow it was deemed immoral and was censored. At times, the society would turn to the cheaper venues, exhibition halls of the wild and wonderful, freak shows, and burlesque houses, but generally they made no distinction between the cheap theaters and the so-called legitimate playhouses. More often than not, they focused on the latter, 
Occasionally, if the society got bored, they would attack the Scully Square venues. But generally, the burlesque halls and such were left unmolested. They were mainly concerned with the dubious nature of theatrical posters. One such poster for Austin and Stones at Tremont Row advertised the following attractions for the price of 10 cents. Six beautiful tattooed girls. Six tattooed men. Mora, the beautiful female juggler. And Elise, the $5,000 automatic figure from the World's Fair in Paris. Between 1896 and 1903, the Watch and Ward Society secured 31 convictions, including the theater manager who allowed John Philip Seuss's band to give a concert on a Sunday. Plays were exceptionally clean during this period because Boston's reputation preceded itself. Most traveling shows avoided Boston for fear of a band's effect on their economic viability. By 1904, Mrs. Wiggs of the Cabbage Patch was the reigning Boston hit. Miss Hazy, what makes you so pinky looking? Anybody think you was going to your own funeral? Oh, Miss Wiggs, I can never go through with that in the world, can I? Well, I guess you can. Every soul in the Cabbage Patch envying you a stylish man like Mr. Stubbins. Yes, Mr. Stubbins is fine looking. But I wish his ears didn't stick out so far. Lousy Miss Hazy, what do you suppose he'd say to your figure? Do you suppose that I'd have dared to judge Mr. Wiggs that way? Yes, I know, but I ain't even sure. Sure of what? I ain't sure Mr. Stubbins is a church member. Oh, Mr. Wiggs was, wasn't he? Well, no, not exactly. But as the scripture says, marry in haste, repent in leisure. Oddly enough, in the midst of this cleanliness, the first official city censor was born, John Michael Casey. Mayor Collins was now in charge of the licensing of Boston theaters, and he needed someone to administer the job. Casey was born and raised in the South End, and his father was a friend of Mayor Collins. He was considered the most suited for the job because for 20 years he had played the drums in orchestra pits throughout the city, particularly in the burlesque houses. After losing his right arm in an accident, the mayor secured a job for him as the city censor. Casey's official title... Chief of the Licensing Division of the Mayor's Office. While the Watch and Ward Society had declared the stage clean, Casey promised... That nothing should be placed upon the stage of any theater to which you could not take your mother, sweetheart, wife, or sister. The fate of any play now depended upon the good taste of Mr. Casey's mother, sweetheart, wife, or sister, or presumably all four. Mr. Casey's qualifications as drama censor are tellingly revealed by his infamous remark that Eugene O'Neill never wrote a decent theme in his life. The relative pureness of Boston at the time is indicated by anecdotal claims that the Watch and Ward Society was so desperate to convict someone somewhere that they acted on a rumor that a dirty joke had been printed in a local Syrian newspaper. They commissioned a Harvard professor to translate the offending passage and found the rumor to be true. The editor of the Syrian paper was fined $100, but since he didn't have the money to pay the fine, he was forced to serve three months in jail. Initially, the Watch and Ward Society had come into existence as a Protestant Brahmin movement, but by the turn of the 20th century, Boston demographics had altered dramatically as immigrants, particularly the Irish, began to dominate. When these Irish immigrants gained political control of the city, the Boston Brahmin cultural censors met a strange bedfellow, the Roman Catholic Church. By 1908, theater managers, undeterred by the new series of attacks from both the Irish and Protestant leadership, began to fight back. They succeeded in getting legislation passed that made the police commissioner, along with the mayor, responsible for decisions on censorship issues. 
The mayor was dependent on votes for re-election and was therefore susceptible to special interest groups. The police commissioner, on the other hand, was appointed by the governor and could not be so easily manipulated. All-out bans became less frequent, but some censorship remained. Use of improper language was often the target. For instance, the Schuberts were restrained from using any of the following expressions in any of their productions. If you drop me like that tonight, I'll have to wear a cushion. Holy gee! Say, aren't you going to get me another beer? I want my pants! I'm going to give you a kiss that would strangle a horse! Meanwhile, Salome's dance, all the rage with the Harvard boys, could not be swept from the stage of the majestic theater. Why? Because in a court of law, the Watch and Ward Society was unable to sufficiently illustrate the lasciviousness of the dance of the Seven Veils. Thus, few plays were banned or even censored until the advent of World War I. During Mayor Fitzgerald's reign from 1910 to 1913, The Easiest Way by Eugene Walter, one of the realist plays in vogue at the time, was an easy target, and the moralist and politi politically expedient mayor took pot shots at a drama that had enjoyed widespread popularity for years. One incident of censorship of considerable note occurred during James M. Curley's first time as mayor. D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, a photo play, opened at the Tremont Theater in 1915 and was immediately met by protests from Boston's African-American community. The Birth of a Nation controversy was probably the only time Boston applied some intelligence to its censorship. Besides the depiction of the Ku Klux Klan as heroic figures, one of the more offensive scenes depicts a little white girl running from a black man whose intentions are made obvious. Instead of succumbing to his advances, the girl prefers to jump from a cliff and kill herself. This scene was eventually removed, but to the African-American community's dismay, there was no outright ban on the film. Several bills were put forth that would suppress all public entertainments that tend to incite racial or religious prejudice, or tends to a breach of the public peace. None of the bills passed except the Judiciary Committee bill, which added a third person to the board. Now, the mayor, the police commissioner of Boston, and the Municipal Court of the City of Boston, through a majority vote, were responsible for revoking or suspending theatrical licenses at their pleasure. Later, Mayor Curley gathered some 40 theatrical men into his office a few days after the birth of a nation fiasco and read them the Riot Act. Perhaps adherence to these new rules is the reason why so few pre-World War I plays suffered from the weight of the censor's pen. Your attention is called to the following regulations applying to features of public amusement which will not be permitted in the city of Boston and are issued by me under authority chapter 348 of the Acts of 1915. Holders of license will instruct stage managers or others in charge of performances to strictly enforce all of these regulations. One, all performances shall be confined entirely to the stage of the theater or the place of amusement, and no female artist will be permitted to leave the stage and mingle with the audience, either in the aisle seats or boxes. Exception to this rule only permitted by order of the mayor to ledger Germain acts. Two, no wearing of one piece union suits by females where the same is worn simply to display the human figure as in living pictures. Three, no portrayals. A moral pervert or sex degenerate. That means no homosexuals. Four, no muscle dances known as hoochie and Apache dances. Five, no performer of either sex shall portray a dope fiend. 
We're in the act of taking a hypodermic injection, the inhaling or eating of dope, or the use in any manner of dope intended to show the effect of the drug on a human being. Six. It should be the aim of the management of places of amusement to see that indecent suggestions and vulgarity are eliminated from the performances. And bear in mind that the substantial element of the community want clean performances. Signed, James M. Curley. Boston Herald, March 25th, 1924. Two plays, One Kiss and Topics of 1923, fall into disfavor with the mayor. Curley warns theater managers. Theater managers had been able to get along with the authorities for several years now without a play being banned. And if they wished to continue, they would observe these regulations strictly. The Boston Herald greeted this ultimatum in the following fashion. You must never use a big, big D. You must never, never say my G. That's my public ultimatum. They are bad words and I hate them. Yes, an H is also barred by me. What never? No, never. What never? Well, hardly ever. Such phrases as my God and good God and even sturdy expressions, damn and hell, must no longer be uttered on the Boston stage for profanity heads a blacklist of offenses for which Mayor Curley called local theater managers to account when he summoned them to his office yesterday. Filth, nudity, and suggestive jokes must also be eliminated or else the padlock will take the place of the present censorship. After World War I and into the 1920s, the gradual decline of the Watch and Ward Society became much more evident. The decade of the 20s was a time of rapidly changing social conditions. Remarked Henry Seidel Canby in 1923. This decade, as he saw it, was one of... The country drifting to the towns, a transportation made easy, the clutch of the environment on the individual loosened. A period of disturbing revelations by science which have confused our sense of right conduct, all emphasized by the relaxations and reactions of a vast war. Ironically, the Catholic leadership was also instrumental in bringing about the demise of censorship in Boston. It became increasingly apparent that the church elders had become irrationally suspect of the new and unfamiliar this is best exemplified by William Cardinal O'Connell's remarks to a group of Catholic college students in 1929. What does all this worked up enthusiasm of Einstein mean? Huh? I have never yet met a man who understood in the least what Einstein is driving at. I very seriously doubt that Einstein himself knows really what he means. <laughs> Paul S. Boyer, in his article, Boston Book Censorship in the Twenties, remarks, In this lull between the two world wars, the censors became less worried about immorality than by the undesirable or frightening in social and political terms. The example was set by the United States government's 1918 Sedition Act, severely curtailing civil liberties by squashing any criticism of the war effort. This led to the Red Scare Raid of 1920, carried out by the Justice Department. In January of that year, the Boston Raids netted anywhere from 800 to 1,200 so-called radicals. The residual effects of the raids could be found in the 1928 banning of The Gods of the Lightning, a play based on the Sacco and Vanzetti case. It was deemed objectionable by Mr. Casey because of its radical subject matter. Replying to a letter protesting this kind of censorship, Mayor Malcolm A. Nichols replied, Since the war, we have had a continuation of seditious propaganda financed in part by foreign sources and actively or passively countenanced by people who may be well-intentioned 
but do not realize what the propaganda really means. We have, moreover, an epidemic of indecency in various publications and on the stage, which constitute a more complexing problem. As yet another example of the arbitrariness of Boston censorship, Eugene O'Neill's Desire Under the Elms could barely make it out of New York. The Boston moralists were up in arms because of its subject matter, a 19th century New England version of the Oedipus tale. Or could it have had something to do with the fact that one of the more disreputable characters in the play is named Cabot? Meanwhile, School for Scandal, the Sheridan play that had been banned in Boston a century ago, was being ignored at the Hollis Street Theater. However, the one last great theatrical scandal of the 20s would involve yet another O'Neill play. Strange Interlude was considered too immoral and too advanced in subject matter to be played in Boston, even though it had won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature and accolades in New York, London, and Europe. Nine acts long, the play was innovative in its use of asides to represent what the characters are thinking. You look frightened, child. Do I seem queer? It's because I've suddenly seen the lies in these things called words. But stop to think. You're just the one who couldn't know what I mean. With you, the lies have become the only truthful things. And I suppose that's the logical conclusion to the whole evasive mess, isn't it? Do you understand me, Charlie? Say lie. Lie. Now say life. Life. You see? Life is just a long, drawn-out lie with a sniffling sigh at the end. <laughs> Hard. Like a whore tearing your heart with dirty fingernails. My Nina. Cruel bitch. Someday I won't bear it. I'll scream out the truth about every woman no kinder at heart than dollar carts. Oh, forgive me, mother. I didn't mean all. City censor Casey was all too eager to voice his disdain toward an O'Neill play. So it comes as no great surprise that he would be hostile towards O'Neill's newest work. Mayor Nichols enthusiastically supported Casey, but the rest of Boston was outraged. Strange Interlude, although not one of O'Neill's best plays, was eventually staged in Quincy to sold-out audiences. It became a phenomenal financial success for O'Neill and was eventually made into a film. Being an exceptionally long play that required a dinner break, its success in Quincy also helped to launch the career of a budding restaurateur who owned a diner next to the playhouse. His name, Howard Johnson. Various anti-censorship and free speech rallies littered the end of the decade, and a description of the Ford Hall rally in 1927 best exemplifies the tenor of the times. Boston censorship was hilariously lampooned, ridiculed, and pilloried last night at a banquet by and for undesirables. There were 700 people in attendance, including the American Civil Liberties Union attorney, Arthur Garfield Hayes, Clarence Darrell, Oswald Villet of the Nation, and Margaret Sanger. Presiding as chief gross master was the dignified Harvard professor, Arthur M. Schlesinger. At the rally, students were costumed to resemble characters and banned books with the word soup suppressed, superimposed upon them. Margaret Sanger, forbidden to speak in Boston, appeared at the head table with a gag over her mouth. In a skit called The Suppressed Bookshop, the owner refused to sell such books as Mother Goose. Do you realize the kind of things that are in this book? Take Jack and Jill. They went up the hill ostensibly to get a pail of water, then came tumbling down. Think! of the conclusions that can be drawn. The owner for selling an obscene geometry book. Uh, all sorts of triangles there. <laughs> but more than rallies and protests, censorship abates by the 30s because the mood of the country has changed. A 1930 obscenity statute liberalized the definition of obscenity by basing judgment on the work as a whole, rather than by a few words, passages, or scenes. 
The new trends in literature and drama became more familiar to the general audience, and the memories of the Red Scare were fading. However, more significantly, the country was in the throes of the Great Depression and other weighty concerns. By the start of the post-war era, the term banned in Boston had become more of a marketing ploy for those who sought to titillate than a true reflection of Boston's waning social conservatism. If anything, plays of any artistic merit only benefited when they transcended the baser implications of the branding. A partial list of censored plays in Boston and the reasons for their censorship. 1931, Juno and the Peacock. Reason. One and sacrilegious. 1935, Tartuffe. Reason. Justice to Jesuits. 1935, Within the Gates. Reason. Immoral, irreligious. 1935, Waiting for Lefty. Profanity, reason. radical subject. 1935, 36, The Children's Hour. Reason. Immoral, lesbian. 1937, Merchant of Venice, Reason. Oi vey, anti-Semitic. 1941, Pal Joey, Reason. Vulgar Dialogue. 1945, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Reason. Objectionable. 1946, Life with Father, Reason. Profanity. 1947, The Iceman Cometh, Reason. Dialogue, Profanity. 1947, Love for Love, Reason. Dirty. Dirty dialogue. 1948, Hamlet. Reason. Immoral dialogue. 1947-48, A Streetcar Named Desire. Reason. Profane and immoral. Overly realistic? 1960, Lock Up Your Daughters. Reason. Obscene dialogue. 1963, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Reason. Dialogue. Profanity. And 1970, Reason. Unpatriotic! The office of the Boston Censor remained until 1970, but by then censorship in Boston had long outlived the social authority it had prior to 1930. The last play to be banned, Hair, by then city censor Richard J. Sinnott, was found objectionable not for its nudity or profanity, but for its desecration of the American flag. What I did object to was not the nude scene, and the nude scene was pathetic. There wasn't a beautiful body in the whole bunch. What I did take action against was the almost continuous desecration of the flag of the United States. And I almost died fighting for that flag, and I think I have a right to speak up to protect the flag of the country I love. And I did this through the office of the district attorney, and the practice ended immediately. about whether censorship still exists in more subtle forms in Boston theater today. Thank you. UBH.org slash forum, F-O-R-U-M. So look for that in the upcoming months. I'd now like to introduce our panel here. Actually, the moderator of our panel will be introducing the panelists. 
This is Matthew Chapran. He is the managing director for the Nora Theater Company in Cambridge, and he will be introducing the rest of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by the panel tonight. Uh, first of all, we have John D. Anderson, Associate Professor of Communications at Emerson College, where he focuses his research in the area of theory and performance. He performs nationally in his one-person shows about Washington Irving, Henry James, and Wayne Faulkner. John Anderson. Tom Connolly is an Associate Professor of English at Suffolk University. He has written about uh, Boston theater history for the Cambridge Guide to American Theater, the Encyclopedia of New England Culture, and the Oxford Encyclopedia of Theater and Performance. Tom Connolly. And Maureen Dizelle is an arts reporter for the Boston Globe, where she writes extensively about the Boston theater scene. She has covered politics, local culture, business, and social issues at the Boston Business Journal, the Boston Phoenix, and the Boston Globe for the past 20 years. She is the author of the 2001 book, Irish America, Coming into Clover, Maureen Dizelle. When we think about bands in Boston, we often uh, are are conjured the image of a puritanical tag. And uh, we were speaking earlier. Tom, is that necessarily the case? Do we necessarily think of uh, the censorship in Boston of theater as being part of our puritanical roots in the city? Well, I think uh, everyone loves to use the word puritan, but it's really quite a bit more complex than that. Uh, it's much more political, really. From the 18th century on, uh, various administrations and political groups have used uh, the theater as an excuse or as a means to push their own agendas. It almost never has anything to do with the content of the plays. Um, in the late 18th century, the uh, anti-English forces, the re residual anti-English attitudes, and more particularly anti-aristocratic and violently pro-democratic attitudes prevailed. And that's one of the reasons that the, the school for scandal was assaulted. And uh, the, uh, it was actually an audience that broke up the performance, tearing down Governor John Hancock's portrait, even assaulting the great seal of the Commonwealth. And this is what encouraged uh, city authorities and uh, state authorities to uh, prescribe performances, not so much because of the theatrical performance itself, but fear of rioting. And this is uh, an aspect of Boston theater censorship that really isn't talked about too much. It's really of a piece with theater censorship in England and in France and in other European countries where the fear of assembly is what really is motivating a censorship in the 18th century and in the early 19th century. I mean, Boston had a huge theatrical boom in, in the first quarter of the 20th, first quarter of the 19th century. There were so many theaters built that there weren't enough audience members to fill the theaters. Um, also, the, the first uh, defense of the theater made in the United States was made in the Massachusetts legislature in 1798. John Gardner, represented from Athol, issued not only a lengthy speech in the general court, but published a beautifully printed and illustrated pamphlet. Uh, it's a miniature history of the theater itself, uh, as uh, advocating even that the, the, the Commonwealth should sponsor some kind of theater. So there's really, um, it, it, it's not one-sided. It is not merely bad Puritans, theater's bad. I mean, you know, the one thing that was missing from the presentation tonight, they couldn't do everything, was uh, the Boston Museum, which was the bastion of Boston Brahminhood and was frequented by the finest members of society. So there's, there's really, it's, it's quite a complicated picture. Maureen, as we see uh, the Irish Catholic working class sort of rise and take prominence in Boston, does that have an impact on its relationship to theater or its relationship with the political structure? Well, to follow up on, on um, some of what Tom was saying, yeah, I mean, class has that. Okay, um, I just wanted to add to what Tom said, which is that, you know, vaudeville was born in Boston right down on Washington Street. And, and, that's, um, and that was absolutely a working, you know, uh, uh, an art form that, uh, um, that appealed to the working class. Vaudeville was um, it's one of my favorite Boston theater stories. Barnum, Barnum was here and he, um, it wasn't Barnum, I'm sorry, it was Keith, uh, who was a circus impresario. And he needed a place to put his acts during the winter. 
So he opened a museum. I believe it was called a, what was called a museum, and, and that was some of um, because that's what the, some theaters were called, right? The Star Museum. Um, so and and it be, and it became vaudeville. But yes, I think that that the history of censorship in Boston has been very political. The the puritanical um, the puritanical element was was taken up by Cur you know by Curley by some of the Irish, the Irish Catholic hierarchy in Boston. Certainly, some, but not all. Let us let's not forget that Eugene O'Neill was an Irish Catholic, <laughs> um, and uh, and wrote the definitive Irish American play, a Long Day's Journey into Night. Um, but it became very class bound, in large part because of Curley, who was actually personally a pretty cultivated man and um, spoke like a Shakespearean prince. Yes. I, I might just I might just add, he, he did not talk like that. Yeah, Cello-like voice. Uh, yeah, he really did. And so did O'Connell. Um, Fitzgerald, and if anybody can find the, the, the actual the, the story, the Yankees in Boston, when the Irish started taking over, essentially formed a club of high-minded cultural organizations. Now, these, they did not tend to like performance that much. They did not tend to like the visual. It was very cerebral, which is one reason that Boston is, has always been a classical music capital, but never much of a city for dance. And they formed these clubs. They formed the Museum of Fine Arts. They formed the Athenaeum. They formed the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Um, when the MFA opened, it was in Copley Square. And um, it got some money from, from the city of Boston with the caveat that they had to let in the great unwashed into the doors. <laughs> when they moved out to the Fenway, the city offered them money, and they turned them down because they didn't want to let in other people. Um, there was a mayor of Boston, I believe it was Honey Fitz, who, by the way, used to have piano players entertaining in City Hall on Friday afternoons in particular, went to Henry Lee Higginson at the BSO and offered some city support now that the city was semi-solvent, and he was summarily turned down. So, you know, the preserves of high art and politics became quite separate and quite antagonistic very early on in this city, and Curley really capitalized on that. In um, you know, so he didn't want to have anything to do with these elite, effete arts, as he as he would characterize them. And again, it was for all different reasons. Um, and um, so the arts have never had public funding in the city, in part because of that schism early in the in the 20th century. I want to jump ahead to a, a very recent affair. Uh, there was a performance by Charles Nip where he portrays a character known as uh, Shirley Q. Licker. It's a blackface drag performance, and representatives, and uh, the panelists are invited to, correct me if I get any of these details off, a representative from the mayor's office actually contacted the owner of the venue and said that this performance might incite rioting, and as a result was not performed. Uh, I believe there's also been nationwide protest of this particular performance among the gay community and African-American community. Uh, and I was wondering, John, if you want to say a little bit about that and how that sort of is a relevant banning of Bo in Boston today. Well, I know of this case primarily through the coverage that Michael Bronski did of it in the Boston Phoenix. <clears throat> and I visited the Shirley Q. Licker website, which has um, a lot of audio clips and images of the performances that Charles Nip does as Shirley Q. Licker. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to talk about a performance that you haven't seen, and that was largely Michael Bronsky's very point, that uh, to preempt the opportunity to protest the uh, performance is uh, a very vicious form of censorship in itself. And uh, it also points out, I think, that censorship is not just conservative forces uh, closing off opportunities to see things, but liberal forces can do that as well. <clears throat> and that was uh, Michael Bronsky's point, was that some of the same tactics used to prevent the Shirley Q. Liquor performance from happening here in Boston in October um, are the same tactics used on the, the far right to close down or to try to close down a show like uh, Corpus Christi by Terrence McNally, which portrayed 
Jesus as a gay man uh, when it was performed in 1998 at the Manhattan, uh, in Manhattan. The Shirley Q. Licker performance uh, was actually closed down in New York City shortly before it was scheduled to appear here in Boston. And uh, there was actually a crowd that gathered outside the venue, and uh, there was a fine of $5,000 to the venue, uh, a nightclub, uh, for disturbing the peace or words to that effect. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting that the history of censorship in Boston that we've rehearsed tonight uh, has been brought up to as recently as October, not in an official watch and ward kind of uh, uh, governmental uh, function, but there still was a slight governmental influence on that case. Uh, the mayor's liaison to the gay community apparently had been in touch with the venue, and that led them to cancel the performance. <clears throat> Um, a spokesman for the mayor's office did say that the mayor had never actually been directly involved in that decision. But there is a concern, I think, that there is a chilling effect uh, that that kind of response to a, a performance can have. Uh, Maureen was pointing out earlier about the um, Birth of a Nation case that was mentioned in the, in the uh, documentary presentation. Uh, was also a kind of complicated story, as I understand it. Maybe Maureen wants to talk a little bit more about that. Um, just, we we were noting that um, it was it was it was noted in in the play, and I think that this is the uh, you know I mean we would probably agree, for the most part, that it was a good in this room that it was a good thing to protest the birth of a nation. Um, we would agree that, you know, there are some uncomfortable images in The Merchant of Venice. Um, we would agree that there are certain people who have been, you know, in groups that have been disparaged in, in performances that we don't want to see disparaged. But I think that we should also be aware that if we put limits on any of that in any way, either, you know, intellectual or, or critical or not funding or scorning, that, you know, we're just essentially 21st century Puritans because, you know, we think that this is, this is better and this is, this is more uplifting, you know, that racism is bad and anti-Semitism is bad and, and homophobia is bad and, and, you know, yes, we all agree with this and that if it really gets out of hand, if it might offend someone or make someone uncomfortable, um, then we just can't have it. And I mean, that's the premise of an awful lot of campus speech codes at this point. Well, that was a question I had for the entire panel, actually, not just about Shirley Q. Licker, but also about Birth of a Nation. Ultimately, if a protest is taking place about content, is that not a functional definition of censorship? So, uh, and uh, an attempt to prevent a performance or a piece of art from being seen solely based on content, or is there a better definition that we could well, what do you mean Adopt. by protest? I think protests are great. <laughs> it's speech, you know. It's, I mean, you know, and that's just fine. I mean, if somebody wants to stand outside and protest something or bring, um, you know, bring attention to something that they don't like, good. You know, they're perfectly within their rights to do that. And I think it makes things a lot more interesting, actually. Or even to find ways to have a dialogue uh, and bring the different points of view into juxtaposition. I was trying to imagine what might have been done in the Shirley Q. Licker case. Um, you know, would it have been possible to have a dialogue with the performer and raise the issues? Because it's, if you go to the website, I, I think it's going to be very difficult for you to tell what the intention of that performance is. And it is likely to offend most of us, I think, in this room. Uh, but it would be interesting to have a chance to see it and then have a chance to talk with the performer about it and to see if there is any justification for the kind of uh, gross racial stereotypes that he's exploiting in that piece, even if he thinks it's for satirical purposes. Uh, what are, What is the larger context that those images emerge from, I think, is a really interesting question to discuss. I didn't read Michael's, Michael's um, P 
piece on, on, on that particular issue. But I, you know, I do know that there are, there's particularly one group of African American performers who do minstrel shows as a way of exploring sort of the history of their own representation on stage in this culture. And, you know, there are people who think they shouldn't do that. You know, they shouldn't be allowed to present those, you know, those images in public because it might give somebody the wrong idea about black people. Um, and I think that we're, we're moving um, more and more in the direction of, of that kind of censorship. And I, I find it quite alarming. I mean, I find that almost as alarming as I find our recent television coverage of our war. Well, it, 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 it brings up the question of you know, who, who is the censor in the 21st century. And again, I think if we can get away from the sort of Puritans did it, Boston Puritans did it, and repeat that 50 times and then cross yourself, um, if we can realize the complexity of the issues involved, particularly as we've opened the door on the idea of uh, early 20th century Irish mayors acting as the voice of the people against elitist art forms, echoing the anti-aristocratic Democrats of the late 18th century. And now we have zealots of another sort protecting us from prejudice. It seems to me that the censor, rather than seeing himself or herself as a moral force, is a populist voice. And I think it's one of the most problematic aspects of censorship in the 21st century. It is, it seems to be, there's always someone willing to tell people how they need to be protected and protecting them and speaking in the voice of the people. And that, that's what we see nowadays. We, we, I, I can't think of an explicit example of a church official or a city official saying, I'm censoring this because it's an affront to our city ordinances. It's always, this is for the good of the people. And particularly since we live in the Casey Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Doing. Casey yeah. knew what he was doing when he said, my mother, my sister, my wife. Yeah. You know, my you know, yeah. Most people, you know, yeah. men controlled the money in those days. Yeah. And, and yeah, even, even some, some of the comments that uh, Dick Sinnott made, I mean, he, he's, he's still alive. I, mean, I wish we were here. Um, the things that he said about what he was doing, he very much did not see himself as this authoritarian force imposing his will. On the contrary, he was a servant of the people doing what the people wanted him to do. You know, he was not an elected official, he was appointed, but he saw, he, in the public statements he continues to make, this was not someone who felt he was lording it over anyone, but rather showing those, you know, New York producers that they couldn't foist stuff on, you know, the good people of Boston. I wanted to tell a little story about something that happened this week at Emerson College, where I teach. Uh, I'm the director of the honors program, and one of my uh, students in the program for her senior thesis, uh, directed and performed in a production of David Hare's The Blue Room, which is um, a re an updating of Schnitzler's La Ronde. It's a series of 10 sexual encounters. And in this version, uh, the female actress plays five different women, and the male actor plays five different men. And they have this sort of uh, uh, daisy chain of sexual encounters. Uh, and the student chose to do this in part to explore the theme of the Madonna and the whore uh, and the dichotomies uh, put on women. And she explicitly intended to uh, include a lot of nudity in the production, or a significant amount of nudity. And her uh, faculty advisor felt uh, at first that she would not be able to attend the performance uh, because that would countenance the objectification of women and uh, there would be an inherently titillating effect in staging this nudity. Oh, God. And uh, there was a certain amount of negotiation that went on. And ultimately, it was a very positive dialogue that emerged. Um, there was never any attempt to censor the student, to tell her that she could not do this. But there was uh, a viewpoint expressed by the faculty member that I think was very educational for the student in the long run. And uh, my understanding is that when the final performance was done Tuesday night, um, that the faculty member did not attend, although she had attended a dress rehearsal with the nudity. Uh, so, and the same 
performance was done, or the same play was staged in New York with Nicole Kidman a few years ago, and uh, there was a lot of prurient sort of titillation in the uh, way the the show was discussed. I, I, I don't mean to dismiss the faculty member's concern. I think it's a legitimate issue, and I applaud both parties for sort of sticking to their guns and the courage of their, having the courage of their convictions. And I guess that's what I would like, ideally, to hope that uh, protests or um, rather than banning work, that we would engage in a dialogue about it in order to further understand the variety of perspectives brought to bear. My question about protest generally seems to be, it, it seems to have the effect of drawing attention towards uh, the work in question. And so I'm wondering, as we're in the 21st century, if uh, that sort of out and out protest to, uh, in effect, close down a production, is that effective at all? Does that just draw people to a production, have the opposite effect of what's intended? Well, certainly that wretched blurb about the Blue Room, pure theatrical Viagra, Viagra. <laughs> and um, it, absolutely, I mean, Band in Boston was something press agents prayed for, oh, yeah. you know, as they, yeah. to, to market their wares across the country. Um, I think, conversely, self-appointed censors or official censors often, you know, shoot themselves in the foot by attracting more crowds. But so I think it's actually more effective to have, a, if, uh, what was that movie, Hail Mary, which had people, you know, circling the theater and, you know, praying the rosary and so forth. I mean, things like that are actually, I, it seems to be much more effective in getting the content dealt with. Rather, censorship seems to release the content into the atmosphere. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then you, and you get something like, what was the Terrence McNally play in New York? Corpus Christi? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, first of all, that was not a particularly original idea. <laughs> <laughs> As Finch and O'Jewel was the only one who had the nerve to point out that, you know, you know what, this isn't really that great a play, and this is not a particularly <laughs> original or radical idea. Um, you know, but that was, that was the Catholic League. And um, uh, they, I, I, they're astonishing. I mean, they just have a machine but the, um, that, that generates stuff if there's something that they, I mean, I mentioned Sister Mary Ignatius in a, in a story once, and I, I was just besieged mm -hmm. with, by letters and, and, you know, objecting to my, you know, my regular columns about, which, of course, I don't write, you know, I mean, this happened to be a news story, so. Um, but, yeah, I don't think, I don't think protests keep people away from, from the theater anymore. I think that they probably actually do benefit, too. I think that, that um, we're, we're much more in danger of, of high-minded content censorship and, and financial censorship of, of you know, edgy or, un, or um, unpopular ideas. I mean, it's very difficult for uh, small and innovative and, and less than, you know, less than mainstream. And I don't necessarily mean, you know, people who put nudity on the stage or people who, you know, I mean, for God's sakes, you know, we've just had puppetry of the penis selling out here week in and week out, and it's closing and it's coming back. And I said to somebody, I saw Take Me Out, um, the, the New York show Take Me Out last night. You know, there are nine naked men showering on the stage of Times Square in Broadway. And I said to a local producer, well, would you, would you do it here in Boston? Oh, yeah, anywhere, anywhere in Boston. So, you know, I, I, think that, I think that those things are over. But would you do, you know, would you do? I'm very scared about, you know, non-positive images of women. My 14-year-old son wanted to do a ten Tennessee Williams play, and his, his drama teacher in, in high school said, well, I don't know if I like, you know, she was some bonkers Williams heroine and was, you know, promiscuous and alcoholic, and, like women never are. <laughs> um, that's, that's the sort of thing I think, um, you know, people who are interested in free expression in theater should really watch out for. You bring up the money issue. I mean, I, it, you mentioned Sister Mary Ignatius. If anybody saw the, fir the original version of Nonsense, I mean, that is quite different from the... I mean, now nuns perform it themselves, you know, as convent fundraisers. Um, it's quite a different show before it became embraced and homogenized. Um, I think that the, the, there's a different use of, you know, a band play. I mean, what, what, what is considered titillating today... Um, 
can can be used by all all, all sorts of marketing uh, mavens. And uh, what we, who you know, are interested in sort of the intellectual ramifications of this, have to consider is again the complexity of it, rather than the simplicity of it. And that's I, I want to mention that this again, that it is it is not simply you know censorship comes from the right and you know, end of discussion, or censorship is religion, religion based. Um, it's uh, very complex, and again. It's troub most troubling to me that it often seems to come from the people, from the very audience that many theater makers claim to be serving. That's, that's another issue for us today. Um, that, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I had a question about the economic uh, question. The, there's an underside of that band in Boston Tag where uh, producers would keep shows out of Boston or had fear of putting up a show in Boston for it being banned. And as we see public funding for theater uh, slashed left and right, and theater being an expensive project to begin with. Is that another form that the censorship takes? Oh, I wanted to uh, point out the controversy in the early 90s over the National Endowment for the Arts funding of solo performances by Tim Miller, Karen Finley, Holly Hughes, and uh, Tim Fleck, the so-called NEA4. Mm. Uh, they were... Um, deny or their their grants were taken away from them ultimately by uh, the government because of controversial, primarily sexual content. And uh, that whole category of solo performance has been eliminated uh, as one of the aftershocks of that whole episode. And I think it's harder for um, avant-garde kinds of solo performers to get the kind of funding now that they were able to get from the National Endowment for the Arts earlier, uh, or 10 years or more. And so there's a pernicious effect there. And I also, that's one example of the economic effect having a chilling effect on freedom of expression. Um, I also think that um, there's a certain concern that we have to have um, well, to support work uh, that might be controversial uh, in other parts of this country, um, something that might not necessarily be controversial in Boston uh, can, is in danger in other places. Um, I was teaching at Southwest Missouri State University um, in the 80s. Shortly after I left, there was a production of Larry Kramer's The Normal Heart that uh, resulted in a state representative uh, complaining that state monies were being used through a state university to fund pro-gay uh, plays. Uh, it was so, there were bomb threats. They had to set up um, metal detectors in the, in the lobby in order to try to prevent people from bringing weapons into the theater. Uh, one of my former students' house, uh, who became a spokesman for the gay community over this in incident, had his apartment house burned down. Um, and, you know, this was in the late 80s, uh, early 90s. So I think there are still uh, a lot of concerns. We're not, the, the whole concern over censorship today is not just censorship by the left. Uh, I think there still are significant pockets of concern, uh, especially in other parts of the country. So where does that leave the theater goer, the theater patron? as we're in 2003. Is there some way that uh, the theater patrons should be responding to this? Is there something that we should be aware of, something that we can be doing in order to uh, keep free expression, especially in the theater, as open and as available as possible? Talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess take no. the risk. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, like, and, yeah. and, and be aware of... Uh, flag-waving concepts such as Broadway in Boston, which is you know, the clear channel entertainment octopus, you know, uh, rearing its many tentacles. Be aware that uh, that the theaters has, is completely industrialized when it comes to, you know, downtown theaters, and that it's really, if you love theater, you've got to look beyond, you know, these prepackaged tours with, you know, non-union non casts and canned music. Um, and, uh, but essentially, though, when you t start to talk at this level, you're talking to an elite. I mean, let's face it, you know, most people who go to the theater, 
you know, can afford $100. You know, maybe we, we talk about wanting to making theater accessible, but, you know, let's face it, ever since the jazz singer, the theater is not a mass art form anymore. So, again, uh, this very question bec becomes very complex. Who are, you know, we're, we're in a church, we're preaching to the choir. Uh, you know, we all love theater, we all want theater to flourish, but let's face it, you know, we're, we're really only talking about an audience across the whole country of a few thousand people according to the, you know, the theater communications group. That's the st statistic they always bandy about. There are really only, you know, ten, a few 10,000 people really are regular, hardcore theater goers in this country. So maybe it's incumbent upon theater makers to be as challenging as possible, to get as much attention as possible, and maybe to even invite censorship and invite protest to get attention. Um, I will point out, just in the interest mm -hmm. of, of not not labeling um, that Broadway in Boston did bring the exonerated <laughs> to, yeah, yeah. to the Wilbur yeah, Theater. Yeah. And they are bringing mm -hmm. Peter Hall's As You Like It, and they did bring the vagina monologues. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's... A, it's a, complex. It's very complex, <laughs> and it's money. It's money. Yeah. You know why? Yeah. They, they could bring those shows because they could afford to take the risk mm -hmm. on it because they're bringing their can non-equity music band, <laughs> you know, to, Bo to Boston as well. But, yeah, I think that... Um, you know, try to patronize, particularly the, uh, I mean, there's some, I've been in Boston for, for 20 years, and I am continually astonished by the quality of the smaller theaters in this, in this city and how good they have gotten, uh, particularly in the last 10 years. I mean, you can really have a vibrant and varied um, theater-going life in this city in a way that was, that was um, impossible, uh, even, you know, 15, and even to, to a certain extent, 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, don't listen to anybody who wants to boycott anything for any reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to uh, thank my panel once again, John Anderson, Tom Connolly. <laughs>